I am Keisha Sutton James. I am one of uh, two fabulous, I have to say fabulous, not talking about myself, of course, um, fabulous talking about the other deputy borough president, of course. I'm deputy, deputy borough president, one of two Manhattan deputy borough presidents, and uh, it is my pleasure uh, to open up this evening for, with all of you. I'm delighted um, that all of you have come out tonight. Um, just for a quick moment, I will say that um, this is... Uh, helping to get the word out around the opportunities in this in this space, in the cannabis space, um, as well as the regulations and, um, and so many other things that people need to know about is a very high priority for our office. Um, one of the things that we focus on is uh, one of the three kind of key pillars of our office is, is around equity. And this is one area in which um, we, we have been putting in a really heavy concerted effort to um, into knowing, uh, understanding the space completely, um, educating, doing as much outreach as possible in order to, to bring the message to uh, to the community and um, and remove as many barriers as possible for um, for all applicants, but in particular social equity applicants. And all of that work, of course, is led by uh, the imitable Mark Levine, Borough President of Manhattan. Woo, yes. <laughs> who I have the pleasure of introducing uh, this evening. Um, and he, I will, I, will, uh, any, I will pass it off to um, Borough President Levine to, um, to introduce everyone else who's here tonight. But I just will want to kick off and say uh, it's, it's my pleasure and honor to get to, uh, to work with him and because of his heavy focus uh, in this area. Um, and in particular, I mean, in equity in particular, but also specifically around uh, the cannabis legislation um, and rollout. So with that, I will pass it off to Borough President Mark Levine so he can make his introduction. Thank you, Deputy Borough President Keisha Sutton James. Give her another big round of applause. Bienvenidos a todas y a todos. Esto se va a hacer bilingüe. ¿Qué les parece? Bien? Okay, we're going to make this comfortably and enjoyably bilingual tonight. We are in Washington Heights, and this is about reaching out to communities to make sure that no one is left behind as we are at the dawn of an entire new industry. This is something that hasn't occurred for many of us in our lifetime, where we have a chance to create economic opportunity in uptown Manhattan and in some of the very communities that have been brutalized by the so-called war on drugs. We have that potential here. We have that potential, but we also understand that this is complicated, that the cannabis industry is complicated. Actually, starting a new business is very, very hard. Uh, in general, I'm not even talking about in the cannabis space. It's hard to start a business it's even harder to start a business that is in a heavily regulated industry of any type, and harder still uh, in, an emergency an emer in an emerging industry where the rules are still being defined, where the federal government is a little bit iffy, hopefully getting better, and uh, we want to make sure that everyone here has the tools they need to succeed to navigate um, and to create economic, economic opportunity here uptown. So we have done now, I think this is our fourth, uh, at least, uh, cannabis information forum. Uh, we've done, we did one in Central Harlem, one in West Harlem, one downtown. Uh, this is our first in Washington Heights. There'll be many, many more. Uh, we want our office to be a hub of information so that you have the tools you need to navigate this new industry, to learn how the regulations work, to learn how you can access financing, uh, to learn how you can get a space because the real estate angle here is also very complicated because of the cost of real estate, because of zoning rules around real estate. There is so much to talk about. The good news is we have a panel of experts tonight and uh, each one of them is amazing. I'm gonna introduce them in a moment. But first, I'd like to ask one of our partners and co-hosts tonight to join us. Council member Carmen de la Rosa, please come on up. She is amazing. Please. Thank you, Mark. And I hate speaking after Mark because he speaks like seven languages. Oh, um, and is known as the Dr. Fauci of Upper Manhattan. And so I can't compete with that. But what I can say to you is that I am thrilled to be here in this forum, sharing the stage and, and the space with so many, specifically women, 
that I respect and that I have worked with, starting with my former colleague, uh, former Assemblywoman, Tremaine Wright, who's now the chair. Thank you, Tremaine. So Tremaine and I were both in the state legislature in the assembly when this bill passed. And one of the principal tenants of this bill, we were proud to vote for the bill, but it took a lot of work for the MRTA to be adjusted, to take into account the experiences we have lived in these types of communities. I'm someone who grew up in Inwood, the Inwood section of Washington Heights, most um, specifically on Dykeman Street. And I know that the experience for a generation of men specifically, of men of color that have been lost in our community due to the war on drugs, it was so important to capture uh, a law that would have equity at its heart, that would take into account legacy, that would take into account those people who have been put through a system of criminal injustice for something that we were then trying to legalize. And so I think that is one of the principal tenets of why we are here. We wanna make sure that our community is informed. We have a lot of work to do to inform the community, specifically the community that is not in this room right now, right? It is those elderly women that I visit at the senior center who say, why would you legalize marijuana? And then we gotta teach them, right, about the curing and the healing powers that we know cannabis has, right? It's about teaching them that if we continue to criminalize this plant, it is our children who will sit behind bars like many of those men that I witnessed when I visited, for example, Greenhaven Correctional Facility around New York State. And so for me, it's an honor to be here tonight to continue to listen to the community as the issues come up. We wanna make sure that you have the information in your fingertips to succeed in whichever field it is that you're trying to make it, because um, this industry is gonna have brand new uh, fields that we don't even know about yet, right? Maybe some of you do, I personally don't. And so uh, we wanna hear from you, we wanna listen, we wanna make sure that we continue to replicate uh, these spaces across the community. Let's take a moment tonight to uplift the voices of the people who are not here right now. I always say, look around the room and identify who isn't here and who we need to make sure comes to the next forum. And then finally, I wanna say that I'm now in the city council. So the city will be able and will have uh, jurisdiction over what happens in New York City. Mark mentioned real estate. The city has the land use powers to make sure that we're creating zones, right, where people can have access to licenses. Um, the community boards, the community boards are a function of the borough president's office in conjunction with the city council. And so how do we make sure that our community boards are friendly towards um, the proliferation of licenses in our community. These are issues that we have to begin to talk about. And so for me, it's an honor to be here. I wanna say I am a proud member of the Black Latino Asian Caucus in the City Council, as well as a co-chair for the Progressive Caucus. And so it's an honor, <coughs> Mr. Presidente, thank you for having me. Thank you, thank you. She's got so many titles she left one out. She chairs the Labor and Civil Service Committee too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So, so we're, we're, we're going to introduce our panel in a moment. You're going to be blown away by the caliber of experts here. Um, I want to I want to acknowledge that New York State, from the moment that this new policy regime was conceived, has put an emphasis on equity and uh, has put front and center the idea that the communities that have been brutalized by the war on drugs cannot be left behind now that there is going to be economic opportunity created. But now here's a warning. Many, if not most, of the other states in America which have, ahead of us, legalized cannabis have at least paid lip service to the idea of equity. None of them have lived up to the standards that I think any of us would consider adequate. So we know that it's not enough just to say we're prioritizing equity. There's a huge amount of work to make sure that this doesn't become another industry dominated by major corporate multi-million dollar entities because believe me, they are ready to move in and they have moved in and dominated the terrain in places like California. Even though, again, California was saying, I think it's fair to say the right thing when they started their industry, uh, I think it should serve as a cautionary tale. So we're not gonna let that happen in New York. New York is going to be the place that gets it right 
And it's partly because of the stature of the woman who is leading the Cannabis Control Board. Um, oh my goodness, Tremaine Wright is one of the most capable yeah. and impressive <laughs> leaders that I've ever worked with. Give black women their flowers! <laughs> and um, she's running the whole state. So the fact that she came to Washington Heights tonight, where she probably has 10 other places that she needs to be, uh, we are really grateful for you, Madam Chair. And I'm gonna give you the mic in a moment. I think I'm just gonna introduce our full panel now uh, because every one of them is, is extremely impressive. Um, so we have, uh, I'll go, I'll go down, down the row here. So we have Carlene Pinto, who is the co-chair of Latinas Grow and a well-known uptown activist. Please give her a big round of applause. We have Annette Fernandez, who is the co-founder of the Uptown Cannabis Association. And uh, I think a resident of Inwood, if I am not mistaken, is Washington that right? Heights. Washington Heights, okay. But we met in Inwood, but all right. You move, you move all over Uptown. We have uh, Christine Bucola, who, did I pronounce that correctly? The first one, no, but the second one, not bad. Christina Bucola, okay, who is, uh, leads her own law firm, I believe. Um, uh, is, it, is it called PB Council, PLLC? No, CB Council. Ah, darn it. Okay, Close. CB Council, PLLC. Um, the important thing is that she is one of the smartest people on the legal aspects of this new industry. Um, and she's gonna be here to answer a variety of legal questions. Um, next we have the one and only Catherine Pichardo, who's here representing the Latino Cannabis Association. Thank you so much for being here. And wait, I don't know if I have the last one on my... Uh, what's that? <laughs> Sandra Hakes from Isol, which is, uh, you are an uptown entrepreneur. You have two restaurants, Sandra? Correct. In Washington Heights and Inwood. Inwood Heights. And Inwood, Inwood Heights. Yes. All right, give Sandra a big round of applause. And we have one more panelist, which is going to be Sal Guerrero. I don't think it's Sal here yet. He's coming, he's coming late here. Sal, okay. But he, he's an organizer with Local 338. Figúrense que fue el varón que llegó tarde, para que vean. Es así. ¿Qué se va a hacer? Um, by the way, a propósito, hay trau traducción simultánea disponible atrás en la última fila. Si ustedes desean traducción, caballero, levante la mano. Ahí está su traductor excelente inglés español. So, don't be shy. If you'd like translation simultaneous in Spanish, you can go uh, to that area and, and you will be covered. So, um, Without further delay, Madam Chair, could I ask you to come to the podium? Uh, Chair Tremaine Wright, thank you. Good evening, everyone. It is such a pleasure to be here this <laughs> up in Washington Heights. Um, I'm going to say, I think that I'm like building up some miles. I'm making it up here a couple of times. So thank you. So I, I, I do want to just acknowledge, though, that the reason I am here and that I have been here previously is only because you have leadership as well as community members who are leading the charge to change the narrative around cannabis. Those people, so one second, I can't see y'all. These are only for a reading. Um, <laughs> so, it really is um, because people have invited us into your house to come here to have this conversation that I am present. So when I'm going to say thank you for what you're doing to make sure that people in Manhattan know what's going on in cannabis, that they know that the resources exist and they know how to they'll have information on how to access it. Um, and I also want to say thank you for the organizers on the ground, because many of them have been leading the charge and engaged in the conversation, building language that we needed throughout our communities so that we can ha have intelligent conversations around this plant that has been stigmatized for far too long, that has caused irreparable, and the war against it and the prohibition of it has caused irreparable harms throughout our community. So. 
I'm very happy to stand here today as the chair of the Cannabis Control Board. We are the body that governs the Office of Cannabis Management, the new agency in New York State that is developing the regulations that is going to govern cannabis and the cannabis operation and the growth of this industry here in New York. So we are well on our way and we are very cognizant of our mission. We are mandated to build an equitable, inclusive industry in New York State. So we got started in October of last year, and immediately we went to work to build the agency. But we also knew that we had to make some changes to start creating access points for New Yorkers. Here in New York State, cannabis, medical cannabis, had been legal since 2014. However, less than 100 and 50,000 people were utilizing medical cannabis and were actually registered as patients. So immediately, one of the first things we did was to expand and try to improve our medical program. We've done some things like attempts to lower the costs because now we allow whole flour to be sold at our medical um, dispensaries. We've uh, made it possible for any practitioner who can write a prescription to actually certify a patient for the program. We've gotten rid of the patient registration fee. So we really figured this is the first and the easiest thing for us to do. Improve the program that is already operational and try to make sure that people who want to participate in a medical program have a means to do it and that we don't have artificial barriers put into place that might um, cause them to hesitate to participate. Then we said, what's next? Everyone's very much excited about adult use in New York State. So we went to work to start figuring out how do we build an inclusive adult use program in our state? It is supposed to be modeled on our MRTA, which is our Marijuana Regulation and Taxation Act. It has nine license types. It, um, works against monopolization. It allows for people to figure out how they want to participate and to create a pathway in. But we knew that building an industry was going to be about more than just giving out licenses. What's really mandated in, this, in the work that is before us is for us to create access points and a network that supports business success. One of the largest hurdles that any small business will tell you is their access to capital. So this year, our governor introduced a $200 million loan fund that we're utilizing to provide loan opportunities to some of our first adult use licensees. We knew that we needed to find a way to support people and to help them gain access to this marketplace. And obviously, access to capital is always one of the hardest um, obstacles to overcome as a small business person. But we needed to also think about how are we rolling this out across the state. Thankfully, our legislators came through and gave us an additional piece of legislation that allows us to offer conditional licenses to cultivators, processors, as well as retail dis dispensaries. We have a mandate to prioritize those who have been charged and convicted of marijuana and marijuana-related crimes. How are we going to do it without the tools? So we needed our legislators to give us authorization to actually create a pathway that allows conditional part participants to enter into this marketplace first and early so that they could get, the ground, get on the ground and start running and that they would actually be able to take advantage of being first to market in New York State. But just having somebody get out, and now many people wanted to be retailers, but we can't have you go and open a store and not have product. Thus the reason we had conditional growers and conditional processors. And we tapped into an existing network of hemp farmers in New York State. They are the ones who qualify to get conditional grow licenses and our, condition, and our conditional processing licenses are being offered to hemp processors. Because all of this is happening very quickly. It's all happening within six months. 
It is happening as we speak. Farmers got licenses in June. They are putting seeds in the ground. I'm sorry, in May and in June, they're putting seeds in the ground and they are doing outdoor grows. Outdoor grows as well as greenhouses. We are focused on sustainability and the environmental impact. We are very cognizant of the harm that um, the demand or the overuse of energy in the production might have on communities. So we're trying to give our first runners, our first test run, our first operators an opportunity to test what outdoor grows can do, what they can produce, and how it might be able to improve our market share here in New York State and so across the country ultimately. So what we're seeing is a seeding opportunity program that is already well on its way and it's being rolled out. Just this past week, we announced our, 200, our loan fund managers. It is Social Equity Ventures, LLC. It is a partnership between one of the most notable investment firms in the nation as well as an ex-MBA player. So we're bringing gravitas into the field so that we can, we can go and raise some money. We need to raise $150 million in the market. That is what is going to supply the loans to our first equity entrepreneurs. These loans will help them to build out stores, um, to do set up, construction, as well as to purchase initial goods for the product, their store operation. This is what we have determined the initial steps for equity is going to look like in New York State. But we're not done. And we know that we have to make sure that we are continuously providing opportunities for people to get engaged and then also for them to have success. We just hired our social equity officer. He is, thank you. And I don't know, many of you might know Damian Fagan. He is well respected in this industry. He is a cultivator. He is a farmer. He has helped to set up commodity markets in Jamaica. He knows and understands what it takes for industry. And I think that that's really important because now he can make sure that we design something that supports our New York entrepreneurs in this growing and budding industry. We know that we are putting things together so that they can excel, they can thrive, they can grow. These are the things, these are the components that we know we've got to hit because otherwise we will have missed the mark in the New York industry. And I promise you, we are all poised for success so that we cannot accept any failures. We really want to make sure that when we give out licenses, our people are ready to go. So we're partnering with New York City. We're partnering with our libraries, the local development corporations across the state to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to do the planning necessary so that their businesses will grow and thrive. This is what equity looks like for us. We hope that we are doing a good job to communicate the work that we're doing on our end. And we really want to say that we're here to listen. So we invite everyone to please connect with us at cannabis.ny.gov. Make sure that you comment on any regulations that we um, release because you have a different lens and we need to make sure that we are able to incorporate comments that are gonna make this industry really work for us. So equity is at the core, but we really wanna make sure that this is an industry that is about growth, prosperity, and opportunity for all. So. One of our partners for the loan fund said that it's about to be a success fund. Mm -hmm. So it's a success fund that's going to support this opportunity moment for New Yorkers. I'm very glad to take this journey with you and I'm happy to be a part of this work. Wow, wow. thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we, I think we're going to lose uh, the chair uh, before too long. So before we hear from our amazing panel, oops, your glasses, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Be before we hear from our amazing panel, um, I would just like to take advantage of having the chair here for a few minutes, if it's okay to the panel, uh, to ask you um, just a couple of questions. First of all, um, it's so exciting to hear you update us on this initial round focused on equity applicants. Um, could you uh, reiterate who is, you have a microphone coming there. Could you reiterate who is eligible to get a license in this first round? 
So we have already issued almost 200 licenses in the cultivator space. Those are existing hemp farmers from New York State. Um, so they're existing small business people here in New York that have converted from hemp farming to now growing a cannabis that has a higher THC content. We just uh, released the regulations for our processor um, licensees, and those also are hemp farmers. The, I guess, new entrepreneurs to the space can are eligible to apply in our conditional adult use retail dispensary license op, um, opportunity that will be coming online soon. We released regulate or draft regulations and application. That window um, for comments just closed a few weeks ago. We received hundreds of comments, so we are in the process of processing them and working on any changes that might be necessary to the regs and the application. And people who are eligible for that opportunity are those who have been convicted of cannabis and or cannabis related crime um, crimes and charges, those who um, and who have had at least two years experience operating a profitable business. And I know that sometimes you get a little bit of pushback and feedback on that. I want to give you some color on why. These people are getting a loan a loan, not a grant, that must be repaid, and they are not using credit scores. So what they're using is your experience to qualify you to get a loan to do the build out and set up of your new business. Some of these loans may go as high as a million dollars. So somebody is giving out a million dollar loan, or even if it's just $300,000 loans, with no credit check. So they really are looking for people who are able to hit the ground running. Our farmers had experience, our processors had experience, and our retailers will have had business experience. It does not have to be in retail, and it does not have to be in any specific industry. They just have to have, have um, two years business experience in a profitable business. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Now, this term justice involved, uh, you mentioned uh, that someone must have a conviction. So yes. if someone was arrested uh, but not convicted, uh, do they qualify as justice involved? No. So we don't use the term justice involved. Okay, forgive me. No, no. And that's and it's a lot of language that everybody's floating around. So I'm happy that you actually did say that because we don't say justice involved. The law specifically says those who were convicted. So someone that was stopped, arrested, charged with something and then actually had a penalty outcome. What is that? And so your penalty outcome can be a number of different things. Tell us what it is, tell us what happened, and that is how you qualify. So no, we do not, There, but if you were, um, say for example, many of um, my, people in my age group were stop and frisked. There were no charges. They were never arrested. They were never convicted of anything they don't qualify. These are people who are actually convicted of something. Uh, this is a, a New York state law, we're in New York state. Mm -hmm. What if someone has a conviction in another state? Or what if someone has a conviction on a federal charge, but not a state charge? We're not able to capture okay, those. Just so it's, this is people yeah. who have a conviction in New York. On, on a New York state charge. Yes. Is that right? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, one of the top concerns I get is about how people will get financing and the estimates that people are going to need to start this business, I mean, it, it could be a million dollars, right? Which is a lot of money for pretty much everybody. Um, can you say more about how you're solving the access to credit problem? So this round of um, licensees are all participating in the loan fund. In order to get a license under the conditional adult use retail dispensary, they must participate in the loan fund. So they don't have to worry about financing. They're taken care of, they get in the wraparound services, we're trying to build success. But the bigger question is, what happens to everyone that's in the general population filling out an application later on? And so we're working with our partners at DFS to help develop a list of banks, one, who actually provide banking services to cannabis-based businesses. Um, I know that there's a rumor going around that they only deal in cash, that's not 100% true. <laughs> 
There are people who are already um, operating cannabis businesses and they utilize electronic transfers and debit cards. And we're trying to build relationship in this state with banks that are willing to do that work. And so our partners at DFS are helping us um, to come up with solutions. Additionally, they're helping us to come up with solutions regarding insurance. Because very often if you find a leased space, you're going to need insurance as part of your lease agreement. And so we're trying to work on what those solutions look like. The one thing that we have control over in the um, loan fund is that they are working with D um, DASNY, the uh, Dormitory Authority here in New York State, which is helping to oversee this process for us. They have relationships with buildings. We're also renting many. We are going into the leasing process with these um, licensees. So think of this as sort of the franchise model. We're helping them scout location, develop to, um, what do you call it? design the interior space, roll out their business plans, come up with standard operating procedures to make any initial purchases and to get their doors open. So we can go through the process with them. It's gonna also be an opportunity for us to find solutions to some of these problems. And I should say challenges, but inclusive in that is our partnership with DFS that is helping us to navigate that space as well. Okay, excellent. Now. There might be people who are here or watching us online who don't meet all the criteria you laid out for this first round, but mm -hmm. this is not the last round. This not is at just all. the beginning. So um, tell us about, uh, I guess, the timing of the, the following round and, and the eligibility at that point, which I yes. assume will be much broader. Yes, indeed. So we've already um, released three sections um, of our adult use regulations. Uh, processing menu, it's processing and manufacturing lab and labeling and then um, testing. So I think it was about three weeks ago. We had a lot of board meetings, so mm -hmm. don't think that um, I'm, I'm not trying to be coy. I really did just don't I don't remember if it was three weeks ago or two weeks ago at this point, but we have released it and they are on our website and they're available for you to review. Those are the first set of regulations that will be um, uh, that are available for our adult use program. We will be rolling them out continuously until we have a complete set. Thereafter, we will be passing them. And we believe that we are still on target to do this by the end of the year, uh, which means that we would be ready to begin applications at the beginning of next year. So when we um, first passed the law, they said, oh, it's gonna take about 18 months. Actually, 18 months is March of next year. So we're hoping to beat the deadline. We think that we can do it sooner. We're working steadily towards it. But the next round, so the adult use regulations are for the entire industry. It is not going to limit those who can apply. Think about it the way we think about liquor. We have been distributing liquor licenses for the past 100 years. We have not stopped. Every month, we're issuing new liquor licenses. Opportunity will continue to exist. You do not have to be the first person to submit your application because we do not have a limit on the number of licenses. This is opportunity, not scarcity. So I want people to remember that we want them to have strong business plans. We want them to be poised for success and then we want them coming to us. And we, uh, we'll, we will definitely be touching base continuously because as part of the law, community has the opportunity to chime in on to give an advisory opinion related to every licensee. So they will go before community boards here in New York City. At least I believe that's still the plan for New York that they're using community boards similar to the way they use um, community boards for liquor licenses. And they will be able to give an advisory opinion about a, a proposed dispensary and or consumption lounge. Those are the two license types where we're asking for community input. Processing, manufacturing, labeling, all of that probably will be happening in industrial spaces. And that's part of the reason why it's not coming before community. But retail, consumption spaces, or will be right here in front of everybody, access to everyone. So we have um, community input on those. That's great to hear. So we are in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. In Manhattan, real estate is a full contact sport. Yes, it is. We fight over everything, every inch <laughs> of space, from sidewalks to rooftops. Um, it, it's great that you uh, just highlighted the role for community boards. Can you tell us more about 
the rules for where you could locate either a dispensary, a dispensary or a consumption lounge in Manhattan, distances from each other, distances from schools, other factors. So we follow the same 500, 200 foot rule that you use for uh, liquor. Many of us are already familiar with it. Um, 500 feet from a school and 200 from, did I say that right or did I just reverse it? Is it 200 place of worship and 500 school or I just flipped it, right? I'm sorry, but so, but it's the 500, 200 foot rule and we go in straight lines. We don't turn corners just like the SLA. Um, and so people do need to be mindful of that, but they also need to be thinking about is just because it's a vacant property, is that landlord ready to lease to a cannabis business? So that's another layer and challenge for people to deal with and that they have to be mindful of because just every open space is not willing to rent a cannabis. And we're not involved in that decision making. That really is a personal decision if someone wants to be in that business. Um, but we are aware of it. We've mostly been talking about, actually, let me pause and say, I want to be mindful of your time. So you just give me a hand signal when, okay. <laughs> when we, we, we know you have a very busy schedule. Um, We've mostly been talking about the application process in the early stage, but um, there's going to be an ongoing regulation of this industry, I presume provided by your yes. office, yes. ultimately. So um, tell us about what that will be like to run a regulated business. What will the oversight be? What will, how will a business person experience that, et cetera? So I like to use as an example things that we've already acc we're accustomed to. Corner stores already get inspected by ags and ag and markets. Um, any eatery gets inspected by the New York City Department of Health. Uh, let's see, tax and finance can always come in and take a look at our stuff and they come through and just to make sure that we have our certificates that we're paying our sales tax. And if we're late with it, they'll come visit us. Um, <laughs> so we're accustomed to inspections and the inspections with OCM will be very similar. If you have a license, you are subject to inspections and or have it to be able to make your books available for review. So if you've ever been late with sales tax, tax and finance might show up and say, hey, show us your, your books. Very similar process can happen with OCM as well. We are tracking everything from seed to sale. So part of the responsibility of anybody involved in the cannabis business is that they need to have available for inspection the information that reflects where their product is coming from, what, the, what is being sold, and what they actually have on their premises. So those types of systems are built into the seed for, seeds to sale system. Our state seed to sale system has to interact with whatever uh, point of sale system a retailer's using so that we can actually continuously track what is being sold and what's moving through our um, New York State industry. Because one of the biggest things is that we have a lot of untested, unregulated product on the market, and we really are trying to get people to know and understand that they have to be able to rely upon great tested product, that there will be opportunities here in New York for people to introduce new brands, new products, and we want you to know what's tested, what's safe, and that you can rely on the packaging information so that you know what the amount of grams that you're dosing, what you're eating, what you're um, consuming. And it's about, it's about us developing a language of trust. We need to be able to trust our producers and our tr producers need to be trustworthy to provide good information to our consumers. Because we're not just building entrepreneurs, we're also building our consumer base. And smart, I feel like Sims, an old Sims commercial, but an educated <laughs> consumer is our best customer. And that is true though. That's exactly what we need. We need educated consumers who know what they're going to look for, that they can have educated conversations about the effects they want to feel, what are the outcomes that they're looking for, how this can be integrated into their lifestyle. That's the kind of conversation that we're building. That's what our community partners have been helping us to do. And that's what we're trying to support as well. Excellent. So we have a very enlightened state in New York, which had the wisdom to create <laughs> a cannabis control board in this, this regime. The federal government is... Uh, on their way. Okay, that's my question. Where's that spot? Yeah, they're yeah, on their okay. way. So, no, I do want to be clear. They're, they're also... No, they're on their way here tonight. They're supportive. No, they really are our partners in this work. I mean, I say I've had the pleasure of speaking on air and with um, Senator Schumer a couple of times. I've been at an event and SBI just showed up. He wasn't even on the 
agenda. He just showed up and it was most timely because there were some immigration questions. And, I, and no matter what we think we're doing here in New York, we need to be able to address the immigration concerns that are associated with anybody that is does not have their papers, has not already received their, their all of their documentation to become a citizen. What exposures are they facing and how do we mitigate it? We have to work with our federal partners on that. The banking question, of course, it's a federal question. We must continue to work with our partners on that. And as we develop those solutions, we also need to make sure that our New York entrepreneurs are poised that they're going to have success when legal, full legalization in this space comes. Because we know that the, the cost of doing business is high in New York State. We, don't, we want to make sure that the businesses that operate here are poised for success and that they have built brands and products that will be able to sustain that shift as well. So we are working hand in hand. Got it. Um, the federal government also collects a lot of taxes. Yes, so do. do we have to worry about the federal government not really having its act together on some of this, that it could have tax implications for our entrepreneurs? So I'm going to say tax implications are real. So here in New York State, we just introduced um, what I'm going to refer to as our 280E solution. So very often you're able to claim expenses on your federal taxes, which helps to balance your, um, <clears throat> or I should say it reduces the amount of revenue in which you're paying taxes on as a business. Because cannabis is Schedule 1, 280E benefits are not available to cannabis businesses. So here in New York State, during our last legislative session, we passed our version of 280E solutions for our um, businesses in New York. So they will be able to claim those expenses in their state taxes versus doing it at the federal um, level. So we do not have real solutions on a federal level yet. They will come in and they will, so the IRS is very willing to accept our tax dollars, and I'm sure that they will find a way to come after those that are generated at cannabis businesses here in New York State. Um, but we are trying to provide a measure of cu cushion for our businesses so that they're able to bring down their revenue with the expense, or they're able to expense their costs like every other business is able to do in our country. So that's really the solution there. One, one final question for you, and if you can hang out here, great. You can chime in on our discussion with the panel and when you have to leave, we, we totally understand. Um, we're, gonna, we're answering as many questions as we can tonight. That's no what problem. this is about. But is there um, more intensive one-on-one -on -one assistance for someone to fill out uh, an application to do their business plan, to apply for financing, et cetera? So we at OCM are not that service, I'm gonna be clear. And we don't intend to um, try to recreate the wheel. But what we have done is partnered with our partners here at the city government, at the state level. So economic development, they're offering services, small business services. SBS has a new commissioner, Commissioner Kim. I've sat and spoken with him numerous times. They are developing support for pe specifically for people who are um, creating cannabis-based businesses. The Association of the Bar of the City of New York, they're right here on West 44th Street um, off 6th Avenue. They offer a neighborhood entrepreneur law project that is willing to support small businesses that are organizing and preparing to operate in cannabis. The Bar Association is on board. We have the New York State Bar. They have a cannabis committee. They're figuring out how they can assist with all of the concerns, not just your small business plan, but your leases. Um, if you need a tax help, we're trying to work with our, um, I think it was the uh, CPAs, our accountants, their um trade organization is also trying to figure out how they do pro bono services to help people create their pro forma um, numbers so that they know what their business outcome should look like after the first year, six months, or 18 months. So we're put, tapping into our partnerships. And the Brooklyn Public Library, I know y'all in Manhattan, but I'm saying it here because maybe Manhattan <laughs> will do it too, but they've been operating a power up business plan writing competition for 15 years. First prize is $25,000 for you to start a business that's going to operate in that borough. Okay. Well, we're going to talk to the New York, we're gonna talk <laughs> so to we the New York get the Public library. library. We want to get New York Public Library doing this as well. We can't be because that Brooklyn. is those are the types of programs, and it's it's free cash. 
And not only is it cash for the winners, so I think it's like the first three winners get cash, but every participant gets a host of services to help them plan marketing, um, lease assistance, business planning. And that's what really this is going to be about. And more importantly, it's going to be about building that B2B community. Because my person that's making a product needs to know who else is processing? Where are you getting your materials from? Who does your labeling? How can I find better packaging? All of these B2B connections happen in those spaces. So we're also going to do our part to help support the B2B community as, an, um, as a regulator. We are definitely and we are very much aware that that is part of our work of growing an industry. But partners like our libraries, our local development corporations, pop-up communities, they help to do the same thing. So we honor it, we support it, and we really look forward to working collaboratively with them all. Amazing. Can we give a big round of applause to Chair Tremaine, right? Wow. Every time I hear her speak, it's like a blast of knowledge. I, I love it. And also um, to our licenses, Mark. That's right? it. And, and, indeed, indeed. Um, so we are going to be taking questions from all of you. And uh, our wonderful team member, Keisha Smith, is here. Can you wave in the back? Um, I don't know if you've already gotten cards uh, and pens, but you can start writing down questions. Um, yes, Keisha, am I right on that? OK, you can raise your hand if you need one. We, we'll get to all the questions we can. Um, I want to start for, for our panel. Let's maybe start with Annette and Carleen, um, following up on the question of assistance. So Annette, what is the Uptown Cannabis Association, and what are the services that you are offering? Um, it's the Uptown Cannabis Coalition. Ah. We're not an association. Okay. We actually are a mutual aid organization that was co-founded by myself and Beck Hickey, right there in the audience. And we're basically PTA moms that uh, are raising kids in Washington Heights. My daughter's 12. I was actually born and raised here. Um, I've lived here for 47 years. And I actually thought about highlighting that this summer is the 30th anniversary of the riots in Washington Heights. And that was a watershed moment in my um, upbringing here in Washington Heights because it was the summer before I went away to college. And so I consider myself a hybrid in this community. And what that means is that I was exposed to uh, a very wealthy institution, Trinity College. And when you're exposed to wealthy institutions, you're also exposed to inequity. So that's where I woke up to how inequitable economics were uptown. And I still live on the east side and can still tell you that it is still inequitable. And so part of what we're doing with Uptown Cannabis Coalition is equalizing and really trying to ensure that everybody, black and brown people centered, low income black and brown people centered, uh, people that were harmed by the war on drugs are centered, and people that have lived in these communities and are still living in these communities are centered. So I'm centering myself in this conversation because I have been harmed by the war on drugs. My daughter as well. My daughter is actually asking to move out of Washington Heights. But I'm not doing that. We're not doing that. We're not going anywhere. We're actually fighting for our community right now. As I sit on this panel, I'm fighting that our community be involved in this conversation, but not just involved, that we are leading this conversation, that we are saying this is what we need, and that we understand that this is a long game. And when I say long, I mean like a 10-year economic restorative program for communities that have been harmed. And so there's that 40% tax revenue that's coming to us. And so we need to be proactive and make sure that people like Carlene and myself are on those boards so that we can advise as to where we think those funds should go in our communities. Uh, because education is disparate. Infrastructure is disparate. Garbage cleanup is disparate. I mean, we can talk in, on and on about the disparities, but that is what we are doing. We're ensuring that the conversation is equalized in all parts of it. And today, I feel very honored to be on a panel that includes all these women. So that is Thank a you, really Annette. important moment because the other thing that happens in cannabis is a very male-dominated conversation. So no offense to Saul, <laughs> but uh, it's, it's really uh, a wonderful thing that you put together a panel of so many uh, talented women. Well, thank you so for being part of So follow Uptown Cannabis Coalition so that you can get the 
breaking information and, and I really appreciate uh, being asked to Thank speak here today. That. And I'll Thank pass you. the mic to my friend Carlene, here, please. Carlene. Yes, give it up for Annette, everyone. <laughs> Uh, my name is Carlene Pinto. I am one of the co-founders of Latinas Grow. My co-founder, Janelle Nunez, couldn't be with us this evening, but her and I are natives to these communities uptown. I have lived between 151st and 207th Street most of my life. My father, when he immigrated from Cuba, bought property in Dykeman, and we got pushed out in 2008. And so a property that we had to sell that we made almost no money on ended up sh uh, in a developer's hands and today stands in that space, 35 luxury apartments going for about $4,000 right there on Cooper between 204 and Academy. So I'm a lived experience when you don't invest in community folks. I I've lived the experiences of the war on drugs. I have folks on my team, give it up for David, Luigi, Sophia. They come from Kentucky, Illinois, and Luigi's from uptown. <laughs> They're committed to growing out the table so that folks look like us and we're having diverse conversations about how all of us have been impacted state to state and also what these rollouts have looked like in other states. Right. We can't just be looking to regulators like Tremaine to uh, create the blueprints without us understanding what needs to be different here in New York. Uh, one big piece in our communities is that Latinas are underpaid 52 cents on the dollar to our counterparts. And in our community, we have a lack of unity with our black brothers and sisters. And I say that as not just an activist, Mark, a social entrepreneur and someone that served on the front lines for Breonna Taylor's family in Kentucky. Uh, we have to forge ahead with our black brothers and sisters, and unfortunately, Latinas Grow is sitting in between the crossroads of what immigration and deportations will look like. Uh, unfortunately, we've already four, four different de deportations the last six years of Latinos in our community who over a $10 bag of weed from the 34th Precinct were prioritized and had their deportation order sent under Donald Trump. And in those moments, I couldn't find federal representatives to help us uptown. It was the New York Immigration Coalition and Angela Fernandez for the Nor Northern Manhattan um, uh, uh, Coalition for Immigrant Rights, right? We have to show up as a community and talk about, yes, the business piece of it, but the community reinvestment piece of it. Because we know all too well in the black and Latino communities that we all have our own one percenters in our communities, right? And we have folks that are gonna be most accessible to the table, and then we have the fact that this is one of the only conversations on cannabis where we've had live translation besides the events that Latinas Grow has hosted uh, in coalition with Uptown Cannabis Coalition. So in a city where we have 40% of our New Yorkers that are foreign born, and here in Harlem we have African Muslims and Haitian Americans and Caribbean Americans, how are we not setting accessible tables for language translation? Um, and how do we all partner and work together? No other state has been able to figure out how to invest the 40% of tax dollars back into the survivors of the war on drugs. And people are using terminology like justice involved when really justice impacted, it's really us centering the harm. There has been so much harm holistically done, and how do we look at delivery workers and farm workers and folks that don't have papeles and how they will now get caught up in what is going to be the cycle of mass deportation. Folks are looking at the federal government, they are not coming to save us, right? We've watched the last few weeks what has unfolded with some of our federal rights. And as a woman, I'm, I'm angry and I'm fired up, right? And so watching uh, you know, women on our communities that can't sustain through the pandemic, we have to center them, we have to center Afro-Latin in our community and we have to center education. So as we talk about this, we have to push for state, city, federal partners to reinvest in education and advocacy. We have so many battles folks don't even know that we have to fight yet. And so I'll leave it at that. We really hope folks wanna partner with Latinas Grow. We're gonna be membership based statewide. We're open to all, but we really wanna get women ready to take lead in the job sector. There will be thousands of jobs. If you're an accountant, a lawyer, we wanna make sure you can be the best accountant and lawyer in this new industry. Thank you so much, Carlene. <laughs> Catherine Pichardo, tell us about the Latino Cannabis Association and what you're offering your members and other entrepreneurs. Yes, thank you so much. Oops, am I, am I on? 
Thank you so much, Mark. And um, I want to echo the sentiments of this amazing panel. I'm super excited to be here among so many women that are doing um, kick-ass work in our communities. Um, the Latino Cannabis Association is a trade association. Um, and so I'm glad that our chair, Jermaine Wright, mentioned the importance of B2B, business to business, right? Um, because at the end of the day, it is on us to empower each other as we embark in this new industry uh, in New York State. The next 10 to 15 years will be critical. And obviously, we have to support each other. So what we do is we educate. Um, participate in forums like this, work on issues like the stigma around cannabis um, and educating our communities. Um, you know, I've had to teach my mom that this is a plant-based medicine and, and you know, have conversations with her about why it's important for it to be accessible and success and for this program to be successful, as well as many of you, I'm sure, have had conversations with your family members and friends. We also do a lot of advocacy, and that's really at the core of um, why we are uh, who we are, um, whether it be um, submitting comments to the Cannabis Control Board, which we've submitted comments to the draft regulations that have been put forth and are in the process of analyzing this new trench to make sure we um, submit them. We're also working with the legislature on the new bills that are being proposed to um, create new mandates for this industry. Um, we are on the mayor's task force on cannabis and are working with the city council. Uh, there's, for example, a hearing tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. at City Hall that is a joint hearing of several committees. Uh, most people don't know about it because I asked how many folks have signed up to speak um, and I was told uh, five, which is unfortunate. We, I encourage all of you to participate in the advocacy process because at the end of the day, this is a very regulated industry, very know-how intensive, very capital intensive. And uh, now is the time for us to make our voices heard to make sure that it is built in an equitable way. And, and we have amazing people like the chair um, who, who are looking out. Um, but we all need to do our part as well. Um, as part of that networking that we do as a trade association, we also um, want to bring others to the table. So as we know information of things that are happening or important advocacy actions, we want to encourage others to, to be part of it. And like I said, I'm glad that we're here at this table. Um, and then the last thing I will say is we are also coming up with some um, ideas and working in, in coalition with others um, for, for our own social impact programming, right? Once we build these successful businesses, we want to make sure that we are reinvesting in our communities in the same way that government government is reinvest, reinvesting through this industry. So I'm excited to be here with many of our members. Uh, just very quickly, I'm an immigrant myself, came here as a teenager, and uh, can tell lots of experiences about the harm uh, of the war on drugs. But I quickly want to give the mic over to Sandra Hakes, who um, grew up uptown and uh, is uh, an entrepreneur who is uh, an applicant uh, in this new industry. And I know many of you uh, want to be applicants. So just very quickly, if you want to introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Sandra Jacquez. And I'm um, a little nervous here, I'm sorry. But just wanted to say a little bit about me. I am uh, born and raised in Inwood Heights. My mom came here at a very early age, so did my dad. Um, at the age of around 12 years old, my mom felt the need to take me to Dominican Republic to study high school. Just the fact that she was afraid of the environment that I was associating with, you know, um, growing up in a neighborhood where drugs was basically right in front of my face. Um, you know, children um, selling drugs and all. I was exposed to it. So she, she, was, she was afraid as a mom, you know, single mom at that time, and I was the only daughter. So I was fortunate enough to go to Dominican Republic High School, came back, college, came back to Post Avenue, that where I, that's where I grew up. And, you know, seeing all my friends, a lot of my friends, um, go to jail um, because of the war on drugs, family members as well, seeing my uncle go to jail for 10 years um, for the same thing right now that's becoming legal. Um, you know, it's really, it was really hard um, on my family. So now I wanted to make sure that I was part of something 
that was going to be positive. Um, you know, becoming an industry that we've all seen um, change, you know. Um, I also was very involved with the medical because my my mother, my sister and my sister-in-law, sorry, my sister-in-law and my aunt both passed away from cancer. So they were, they had that stigma of the medical use, you know. They didn't want to use it because it was drugs and, you know, seeing all the benefits that they are, you know, with this leaf. I wanted to make sure that I was also part of an industry and to give awareness to people that, you know, it's not only... <clears throat> recreational, which is obviously what I'm applying for, but it's also medicinal. You know, there are a lot of benefits with this, with this um, leaf. So I'll leave it at that. Um, thank you so much. And I'm very happy to be uh, a member of the LCA because they have helped me um, transition and get the experience and all the learnings that I need in this industry, which is very difficult because there is a lot of knowledge that's involved. And, um, you know, I'm learning. And um, I thank you all for, for making me part of this. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Sandra, for being here. Before we hear from our final two panelists, I think I'm going to see if I can throw a question or two to Madam Chair before she has to run out. I think they're very quick. Um, so uh, uh, Madam Chair, I have a question here. For the DASNY program, that's the dormitory of the state of New York, dormitory authority of the state of New York, which is handling the financing, can I provide my own location? No. <laughs> okay. This what? is like a franchise. I want you to think. Do you want to take the mic for a moment? Yeah. Okay. You can hear me. Okay. I want you to think about it like McDonald's. They help you cite the location. They help you build it out. They know what you to help you come up with a floor plan so that the flow works best. That's really what the benefit of being a part of this program is. This is not for everyone. Mm -hmm. There are people who already. We know in the business, they got a brand. They have something that they know. They scouted out the location. They have a relationship with someone that owns the space. They know they can work through a lease and they've negotiated it. They're ready to hit the ground running as soon as licenses become available. This is not the program for them. This is really a program for those that want to be held by the hand and walked through the process. And they are willing to allow some of those creative and ideas to be led by mm -hmm. someone other than themselves. And so, and it's okay because there's space for all mm -hmm. of us in this market. I promise you, but your favorite restaurant is probably not McDonald's, but McDonald's will feel no pain. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> right. and so I just want everybody to be thinking about it that way. Can I just so say something to that? I really want to say Please. something on there because first of all, I mean, I've been smoking cannabis since I was 18. And, and I think it's really important that we come out of the green closet. So folks, you know, be proud of your cannabis use. You know, like you tell your story about why you use it because there is a culture that is undeniable about New York cannabis. I mean, we are in the home of the haze. Uh, Washington Heights, <laughs> yeah, we know haze. Haze is hard to grow, so we're master cultivators. And so we got to lean into those that intellectual property that we have, you know, that's the gift. And, and all of us have an ability to be successful in this economy because we love the plant. Yes, it is, it is medicine, but it's also revolutionary. And it's a, a form of liberation for us. This is your opportunity to come into the light and do what you love and be liberated from a structure of work that does not work for black and brown people. Necessity is the mother of invention. I could tell you in Washington Heights, Dominicans are the number one entrepreneurs. You see the carritos that they make out of bicycles, the piraguero, the habichuela con dulce, and maíz cacao. We know how to run businesses and we know how to make money out of nothing. Lean into that innovation because that's what this culture is about in New York. Like we could do it like nobody else. And can I just also, I just want to emphasize what she's saying because I know everybody's like, oh, it's going to take so much money to no. open. It does not have to be that. We do not have to have a store that looks like the counter at Bergdorf. No. Nope. We do not have, and, and, and I'm just there's saying a like, for it's everyone, a, right, there yes. is someone, there's an opportunity for all of us. And your business does not need to look a certain way in order to be successful. So. I just want to amplify what she's saying here. I want you guys to know that, and that's speaking truth there, 
Thank your you. business is yours. It is your baby. You will be spending 15 hours a day there, nobody else. That is the work that you are committing to, and it should really feel personal. Mm -hmm. And it should be a reflection of your creative spirit. And that's really what we would love to see because that's what makes experiences in New York. People don't come to New York because that's they're right. going to eat at the Olive Garden. That's they right. come to New York to eat. That's right. And I don't mean to put down the Olive Garden. They come to eat at the Hole in the Wall Mexican spot. It's like the, they, everybody wants to go and feel whatever that experience is that makes it uniquely New York. And so please tap into that, tap mm -hmm. into that beauty, tap into that part, because that's what's going to make you the best. And I promise you, and I don't mean the best of town or the best on the east or in the, west, the best. And so we really just have to tap into that spirit of who we are in this process. Personally, I prefer Malecon on 175. <laughs> We're going to take you there one day, Madam Chair. You're going to love it. As Rey del Pollo, Rey del Pollo. Ya va a ver. Here's another question for the chair. Uh, could you talk about the mentorship program that the hemp farmers yeah. must participate yeah. in as part of their conditional grow licenses? Yes, so we're in the process of developing that. As I said, this is happening very fast. We just got the law about two months ago that allowed us to create the um, conditional program, including the hemp uh, growing licenses or cultivator licenses. So we're working now to develop partnerships with a number of the universities so that they can do the what I'm going to refer to as classroom education for um, growers because one, many people who are from cities, let's just start off with that part, who are from cities and <laughs> want to get into cultivation don't have access to it. Mm -hmm. And then we also have a whole bunch of people that would love to have been able to participate in the cultivator program, but they, without access to land, could not have been hemp farmers. Because not only did you have to have a license, you had to have actually grown for two years to get this license. Mm -hmm. Acknowledging what we, whom we excluded, we're trying to find a way to make sure that we can pull them in and to give them the skills necessary to be successful in any grow operation that they want to be involved in as we move forward. So they will be mentored by existing farmers who allow them to come onto the premises, see, touch, feel, and live some of that experience. But additionally, we have to roll out a curriculum, a solid grow curriculum, so that you understand the botany, the plants, the growth, everything that's happening there. And we're working with two of our universities trying to develop that um, right now. The goal is to have it online and operational by the end of the summer, so that through this fall, they will be going through that mentorship program mm -hmm. and um, they'll be able to reap the benefits of it. Wonderful. I want to bring attorney Christina. You can applaud for that, absolutely. Uh, I want to, I want to bring attorney Christina Bukula into the conversation. Christina, you um, know these regulations inside and out. Maybe not as well as the chairwoman. I don't know. Master class here, everybody. It, but. it is a little intimidating, I'll admit. Um, what do you think are the, the most underappreciated or misunderstood aspects of the regulation that the public really needs to know more about? Uh, your input. I don't think that most people realize that as soon as these regulation drops, that triggers initially a 60-day period in, in which uh, members of the public have the right, and if you ask us, the obligation to respond to those regulations and say, hey, this doesn't look right, this doesn't feel right, um, this should be changed, we need further clarification here, because again, this is your industry as much as it is anyone else's in New York, and looking for that public input is incredibly uh, important. Um, for example, uh, during this last conditional adult use retail dispensary license, like the, the chairwoman said, there were hundreds of comments. And if any of those comments lead to any kind of substantial change in the regulations, new regulations drop, and then there's another 45-day period. So maybe we can ask if people missed their opportunity in this last 60-day period, will they get another opportunity in a 45-day period? Oh, I can't comment on it. Oh, okay. All right, I was hoping. I nice was try, hoping though, for Christina. Very nice try. Did not foil. She was not foiled at all by that. Okay, so 
Um, it could be that a, another 45-day window to comment is, is, is open. Otherwise, you know, o o OCM and the Cannabis Control Board, uh, as they did for the conditional adult use cultivator license, they might issue guidance. And guidance is a way to further the program along without actually having to, to seek um, public input. I do want to stress this. Uh, I've, I've been an attorney for over 20 years. I've worked the last eight in cannabis. My background is in helping smaller companies raise capital. Um, I've spent the last three and a half years um, with no shortage of work in Massachusetts where I am licensed to practice law because I either help uh, newly minted license owners raise capital because maybe they don't have enough and just got through the process or in the event that they can't raise capital, I help them sell their licenses. And I cannot underscore to everyone in this room, whether you like the parameters around the conditional adult use retail dispensary licenses or not, it is unprecedented. It is unprecedented to pair any kind of monetary loan, grant, gift, whatever, to get the initial uh, equity applicants off the ground. Never, it's never happened. Um, I also want, there's been a lot of discussion this evening about the 40% of cannabis tax revenue to go into community. There are only two other states that have successfully incorporated this aspect into their cannabis law, one of them being Illinois and the other one being in ca California. Now, importantly, um, the cannabis, con uh, can cannabis Advisory Committee was just appointed last week. And those individuals will have responsibility for directing where that 40% of revenues go. Um, it's publicly available. Some of those individuals are, in fact, at state agencies and hold office. They people, at, state agency people are only there for advice. Okay, they just... Only the 13 who are appointed right. actually get to vote on where the money's going. Sure, but they advise. And they so can advise. they can advise. So that's another opportunity for your input to go there. Right, and your influence to, to look at those people and say and and start to learn about that process. So, for example, in Illinois, they um, uh, the the fund works with not for profit uh, agencies that are embedded in community, and they've done everything from wraparound services around housing to actually having a boxing club um, for community development. So that's another really important way that community input is essential for the rollout of this program. 40%, that is also unprecedented. So, um, you know, as, as, as much as we may critique OCM, CCB, the program, this is happening in two ways that it's never happened before. And so for that, I think we really need to congratulate New York. Yes, we do. Let's see if we can knock out a couple more quick questions for the chair. Do the DASNY applicants um, need to go in front of community boards? Um, now we haven't changed it, so as okay. far as we know, that's exactly. We're gonna, we're gonna take that as a yes. W will dispensaries be able to quote import marijuana from other states Most like the what? Definitely not. Okay. <laughs> Interstate travel with cannabis products is prohibited. Please do not cross state lines. Don't try to get on a train over to Jersey and come back with some in your pocket. Don't get on an airplane with it. It is still illegal to cross state lines. Please get acquainted with what will be grown in New York State. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well put. Um, will DASNY dispensaries need to all look alike as a franchise would be? Okay, no, so. They don't have to look alike, but I'm saying that it's like a franchise model because they are being um, wrapped around and guided through this process, and their sites are being selected, be, uh, pre selected. So it's not like they can say, oh, yeah, I want to be in this spot at my corner and or I own this building and I want it to be in my storefront. These are pre-selected. It's a decision making process that they don't completely control. OK, will there be protections for those who apply for conditional and regulated adult use licenses and are denied for whatever reason? So I don't know what they mean by protections, but I am going to say we are a public agency. Information given to us can be foiled, can be um, requested in a um, request for information. 
And so people need to be mindful that that information cannot, we cannot stop other people from accessing it. If they ask for the information, they can get it. Um, so no, we can't protect you, because I'm assuming that it, it's like a protection from the feds or somebody else. That's beyond our reach. Okay, I'm going to go to Saul in a minute. We're going to do one more question for the chair. I'm interested in vertical cannabis farming and electric trucks. Are there, says, are there blocks for this where I can do, where I can start and be in compliance? Those are micro businesses under our New York State law. You are allowed to cultivate, process, manufacture, package, and sell your product. Mm -hmm. That's a micro business in New York. It's probably somebody who is working on genetics, comes up with a great brand, wants to really promote it. That is a micro business license type in New York State. And I am a very big proponent of that license type. I think that it offers a wonderful opportunity. And I think if you're looking for some models of how you might be able to really maximize that type of license, Look at some of the wine wineries in New York State and or some of our craft beer businesses because those are really good models and they kind of demonstrate what micro business, how a micro business can do really well, as well as some of, I think, some of our ice cream companies are similar. Mm -hmm. are excellent, similar excellent. I think. Yeah. I think we should do a tasting tour, Madam Chair. <laughs> 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 um, so we, we've been focusing tonight on the entrepreneurs, on the, on, on the owners, essentially, but we care about workers here. We care about worker protections yeah, worker. and worker rights. Yeah. So we're thrilled that Saul Guerrero is here from Local 338, which is already organizing in this space. Welcome, Saul. Hello. Good evening. First off, I want to say I am honored to be next to this panel. Uh, you guys are doing awesome work and just want to applaud you. And also with the recent events, I want to say that I stand with you in every way possible. Um, so Local D38, we've been involved in the cannabis uh, space in New York State since 2012, before it was a thing, before everybody was filling rooms to talk about it. Um, when we realized that there was a real possibility that the Compassionate Care Act would pass, we got very involved in Albany to make sure that there were certain protections for the workers, uh, because just as Mark said, and thank you, Mark, for your introduction, um, you know, we always talk about everybody that wants to get into space. And I'm so happy that everybody wants to get into space, especially for our communities that have been impacted. We definitely want uh, that the social equity piece be a real thing. And I think that the OCM is doing a great job, it's taking a little bit of time, but they're doing a great job, you know, in getting that done. Um, but what happens once these businesses were going to start, right? So that's where we stepped in. We wanted to make sure that the industry gave back to the communities. That's our way of looking at social equity, right? Because not everybody can become an entrepreneur. Not everybody's gonna have the resources or the ability or the know-how, right? And we know that even when there's thousands of licenses, there's, there's gonna be hundreds of thousands of workers, maybe. Um, so what we've been doing is we've been strengthening uh, this nascent industry from the inside out. And what we did is we've been able to attach uh, through the legislation in Albany and through all the lobbying that we did for the Compassionate Care and now for the MRTA, uh, the, the uh, practice of having uh, for your licensing uh, a labor peace agreement, right? Uh, I think that most of you have heard of it, but it's basically an agreement uh, with the bona fide union. And in New York State, we have become that. Uh, that says that when these businesses are up and running, they're going to allow us to come and speak to their workers, right? They're just going to stay neutral and allow us to speak to the workers, tell them what we've been doing. Up until now, we're happy to say that out of the 10 uh, ROs that operate in New York State, eight of them have chosen to join us. So we represent 80%, thank you, of the medical cannabis industry. We are currently organizing the last two. Uh, and our goal is to hopefully finish this year with 100% unionization of the medical piece so we could hit the ground running when adult use really happens, right? Because we know that these companies are going to start to come in. Uh, they're going to come with money from other states. And a lot of them are going to gobble up the small ones, right? And like right now, if you know, like Etain is being bought out, Metam is being bought out, all of the smaller companies are being bought out by the big ones already. For the ones that already have a contract, they're lucky because that protects those workers, right? But for the ones that don't, we need to make sure that we get in there. So what we've been doing is we've been strengthening the industry, right? And what does that mean? It means higher wages, guaranteed increases. The one thing that I always ask for workers, hey, in your last job, if you worked there four or five years, when was your yearly raise? And most people look at me blank that I, 
I don't know, like whenever the boss gave me a raise, right? And they would normally say, well, we'll give it to you in January. And then January came in, maybe March, and then maybe June, and then another half year when you're still making the same rate, right? So when you have a union contract, you know that every whatever, April, that's when my race kicks in, right? And I get it every April for the next three years, and then we negotiate again. So we've really been able to strengthen these contracts. Also, they get more pay time off. We fight for things like pay time off for part-timers because most of these companies that have come in from other states don't believe that part-timers should have any pay time off. And we frown upon that strongly. We give them things like free and affordable medical care. Uh, especially during the pandemic, our members enjoyed having free health care, which went a long way. Most of our members are very happy to have health care that is better than their parents or better than ours. <laughs> right? They have great health care. And we're able to do that because as a union, we're not for profit. We're able to give these companies a great deal. But the catch is they have to pay for the whole ticket. Right? Our members don't pay anything. Um, and besides that, obviously, we have all the job pr protections that you have with the union, right? You're, you're no longer at will. You're just cause. In other words, they can't just fire you because the boss comes in in a bad mood, right? They have to fire you if you've done something enough times or if something that is egregious enough. And they have to prove it to us. They can't just say, well, this is what they did. Okay, prove me. You know, obviously, these places have cameras everywhere. We have, we could view the tape. We could, you know, get uh, statements from other workers, et cetera. So, I mean... And this is what we've been doing for the last 10 years. We, like I said, we've organized a lot of the industry. And our goal here for any of the entrepreneurs is just to introduce ourselves, say, hey, listen, you know, we're 338. You know, don't be scared of us either. We can be a partner. Um, we would like to partner with all the entrepreneurs that are coming in to the state, into the space. Uh, if you want to know more about the LPAs, please look up CannabisLPA.com. That is our website. Uh, I can give you my card also so we can connect um, and... I'm here to answer any other questions. Thanks. Thank you, Saul. Um, absolutely. Uh, Carlene has a question. Take the mic, it is easier to hear, yeah, okay. It's on, it's on, yeah. yeah. I think one thing we all have to anchor, and it's easy to hear, Sal, you go through everything. As someone who, a labor of love, organizing for undocumented immigrants to have driver's licenses in the state, I fought, got arrested a bunch of times fighting for dreamers to have access to the Federal Dream Act. I cannot stress to you enough how important it's gonna be to talk about labor and who's being exploited in this new industry. It is so important when we talk about farm workers in New York State that people envision what is in, uh, essentially like um, exploitation of every area of life for some farm workers that are undocumented in upstate New York. And I want to give a lot of love to Nikki from 338, who's been leading the way. And they've really been putting their uh, best foot forward and trying to mass mobilize across the state to make sure that they're doing the forefront advocacy and education. So for everyone I want us to center, there are no protections federally. And it is the wild west in some municipalities in upstate New York. We saw what happened in Buffalo, right? There's a lot of things happening that could cause undocumented immigrants to end up in some type of pipeline to deportation. We're going to need everyone to show up and always put them at the forefront. So thank you so much to the folks at 338 for the work that they're doing. Thank, thank you so much. So how many potential jobs are there in New York State in this industry? Well, that's a question that we get a lot. So uh, there was a study done recently, and I can't think of the name of the university. I apologize for that. But they were saying anywhere between 30 to 60,000 jobs Incredible. will be, Incredible. you know, that's the ballpark. It depends if it's going to be a $1.7 billion industry or 3.4. But I'm sure that we'll get there. I mean, it's New York, so. And just, you explain this, but just to understand, sure. every single business, whether they have five employees <laughs> or even smaller, it's a separate unit, and they have to vote together to join the union, right? This is not a statewide uh, umbrella. Right. This is one business Correct. after another. Each business, right. each employee will have their right because uh, we would never take away the you know their rights uh, to you know make a decision to see if they join us or not. So yes. So there will be hundreds of different elections, basically. Right. Right now, we already have I would say close to a couple hundred uh, LPA signed with all of the new entrepreneurs that are coming in, and we're going to probably get thousands right. more. <laughs> yeah. Can't wait. Can't wait. Okay. Hey, so now we have to on answer. That, on that um, 60,000 yeah. jobs, yeah. I think it's important to highlight to organizations that are already on the ground that there's a ton of workforce development grant money available. So there's uh, Cornell University that's doing workforce development. Um, and there's a bunch of other organizations that are, that are providing grant money to people like us 
that are on the ground providing cannabis education, workforce development, job training, translation services. I mean, you name it, be innovative, think outside of the box. But if you're impacting social equity outcomes in the workforce, there's money available. I think I also wanted to add to that then. Uh, so when we talk about 30 to 60,000 jobs, that's just in cannabis though. That is not all the ancillary businesses that are going to come around cannabis. So just want to make that clear. We could have hundreds of thousands at that point. Yep. And prioritizing New Yorkers and the job hires. We don't need people coming no from problem. other states. Amen to that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Amen to that. Agreed. Yeah. Prioritize New York City residents. How about right. that? Come on, Mark. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, so now we have we have more questions. We're going to try to get to as many as we can. Uh, we don't have our national expert chair right with us, but I think we got some good brain power up here. So let's do what we can. Are there additional qualifications for the conditional adult use applications, such as veterans, minority women, on, or residing in neighborhoods that were affected by the war on drugs? Christina, yes. Hi. Uh, no, the qualifications are uh, justice impacted, which you can be yourself or a family member can be justice impacted if you, in fact, have the conviction. So if I had a conviction, my mother, my father, not my brother, but any dependents or um, if I was a dependent of someone else, they would all be able to have that relationship under the conditional adult use retail dispensary license. Um, and again, we heard that that 10% uh, ownership um, is pretty hard and firm. And it, it I, so when people, I, I, I think the chair said it best when she said there's no credit score associated with this. So what are they subbing in for credit scores or subbing in experience? Um, I do want to take just one second because we've been bouncing around. We've thrown a lot of terms out here. Um, we've said schedule one. We've said 280E. We have these num right. What? All, all of this stuff. And so I just want to bring it back to one essential thought. And that essential thought is cannabis remains illegal on a federal level. And the trickle down issues that that causes is numerous, right? So when we talk about banking, small business owners, you can go to the SBA, you can go to your local bank. You can't do that in cannabis. Not going to happen. There might be certain uh, cannabis-specific banks that might uh, afford you um, some, some line of credit uh, under some pretty onerous circumstances. But uh, that what is normally available to every business owner isn't going to be available to you. And when we talked about 280E, if there's some small business owners in the room, um, business owners can usually take uh, credits and deductions. But they can also do something called adjusting their costs of goods sold, or COGS, if you've ever heard of that. Now, depending on where you are, and I, I don't mean to belabor this point, but um, depending on where you are in the cannabis life cycle, if you're at the very beginning and you're cultivating, you can deduct or you can uh, reduce your cost, uh, you can increase your cost of goods sold and, and uh, essentially pay less tax. At the other end, when you are talking retail, even though New York State has recently granted this relief at the state level, you're getting slammed in federal taxes. You are probably looking at, if you have a retail operator, somewhere north of 60% of paying taxes. So let's not get sh sick or sh shock. You heard it here. So the next time you hear it, you're like, oh, I'm, I'm already informed. I know all about this. Um, and the other thing I um, wanted to say is we talked about vertical integration. And that is our medical providers here in New York are vertically integrated. They control everything from the time they put the seed in soil to the time they dispense it to the patient. New York was really intentional and said, you know what? We don't want to do that. We want to break up the verticals. So uh, as we've said here tonight, by breaking up the verticals, what does that mean? That means if you're on the production side of cannabis, with the exception of the micro business license, which I'll talk about next, you're not dispensing it. You're not having social consumption around it. You are not having delivery around it. You are producing it. You, you're cultivating it. You're producing it. Maybe you're distributing it to another license holder by stacking licenses, but you are not consumer facing. 
Um, I don't even remember the first question that you asked. I just wanted to inform, so I'm going to pass the mic to someone else. I'll actually do a quick clarification on that as well. So it's not only the requirement that you um, have a, the business experience, successful two years, uh, at least 10% ownership, and also uh, be just as involved or impacted in the way that's been described, but it has to also be the same person. Yeah. So it's not me and my cousin or me and my sister or me and my friend. So that's one. With respect to the other requirements, um, uh, Mr. Borough President, um, it's not necessarily a requirement, but rather a point-based system where you are expected within a rubric of grading applications to receive extra points for being part of what we call the social equity um, um, applicant pool. And so we know that in New York State, at least 50% of licenses um, will be granted to social equity applicants. And what that means is you're minority, Latino, African-American, Asian, that you're a woman, that you're a service disabled veteran or a distressed farmer. So those are sort of the uh, extra point categories that you have in your license application as a social equity applicant, but they're not necessarily requirements. Once the market opens fully, anybody can apply. Okay, that's extremely helpful. One piece, Mark, I just P wanted to flag so Please, that please. With the veteran piece, it's really important that when we're talking about the causes of enforcement and all of the folks that can lose here, if you are someone, when we're talking about the intersection of immigrants, the same thing with veterans. Folks can lose their benefits, folks can lose their, uh, you know, when we talk about housing, health care, these are all critical areas that I know folks are not really mobilized around voting right now because we're fatigued in this moment, but tomorrow's an election day on the state side, right? It's so critical that we're leaning into our state right now when we need them to show up. And and so like Catherine just mentioned with like some of the overlap pieces, we have separate agencies in New York that haven't even started to sit and talk with uh, the chairwoman, right? So like the Office of New Americans, the Office of Veterans Affairs, right? We want all of those folks to send a cannabis rep into these specific areas so we can build out more inclusive regulations. And last piece I wanted to say about Chicago and LA, I took six folks from Latinas Grow to California to sit with 25 social equity licensees there. Big Kiko, who owns Gorilla RX, the only black owned, female owned dispensary on Crenshaw, she had to FOIA the local government and sue them for, for them to release another 100 licenses for the community, right? So we have the power as people to build around this. And it's so important that this is the first of many conversations folks are joining in. Everyone here has a lot of different experience and expertise, but we need everyone in this room to start picking up the call to action because as you can see our borough president can set the table it's up to us to all make sure everyone's eating at the table well said well said um, this is actually a question for me mr borough president yeah. what can we do to unlock the university owned properties they mentioned oh. columbia and yes. <laughs> yes. wow did you guys write this question <laughs> So that they will consider leasing to cannabis businesses. We're going to talk directly to Columbia, who is our host tonight. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> well, clearly, clearly, they are already helping out, um, and to NYU. And I think this raises the question of uh, institutional uh, property owners more broadly, because if you look around Manhattan, hundreds and hundreds of storefronts are owned by everything from schools to churches to museums to other nonprofits. Um, and they should be making this space available, um, especially for uh, social equity motivated entrepreneurs. So we're going to follow up on that. Okay. Um, just, just one quick thing please, there yes. that folks should know. Um, a lot of times, uh, some of these institutional players that have property with mortgages because of the federal regulations are not able to rent to cannabis businesses because of um, you know this still being uh, a Title I drug. So it's something that from the advocacy perspective, I wanna put it in everyone's head, we should be activating upon. Uh, the banking issue, of course, has been mentioned. There are uh, state uh, credit unions that are banking cannabis. Um, because they're not federally regulated. So inform yourselves on that. We're happy to also provide the information. There are some banks that have started to ban cannabis. Um, so, so there's a lot out there that we can be working together on, and I will agree uh, with, with Carlene. We need each and every one of you to be part of that process. Wonderful, okay. Um, 
past information received placed the application, the, the fee for a license at 100000 Is that still the application fee? And is there help to cover the cost of that fee? The current... The fee for the conditional adult use retail dispensary license is $2,000. Now, there are people out there who will help you prepare your application. The latest one I heard for a retail license in New York City was $425,000 plus a success fee plus equity. What are they doing for that amount of money? I don't know. But... Here's another thing, and, and the chair isn't here to say it, but I will also applaud New York City, be, or New York, um, and if you look at the actual application and how it's put together, a lot of these things are um, items that people can do on their own. You don't need a lawyer. You need a lawyer when you're gonna put your name down to someone else's and make a signature if it has to do with money. You don't need a lawyer to, set, to, have a, to establish a solo member LLC. You don't need a lawyer to get an EIN. You don't need a lawyer to find your business records. In fact, that would be a pretty terrible use of a retainer because you blow through that. But if you start going through the regulations or the applications and seeing, okay, they're gonna need this, they're gonna need that. This is, this is stuff that you can, most applicants can probably do on their own. And I will say that New York has been really much better than other states because other states, they want you to apply and have, you know, your, all of your procedures. How are you going to write procedures if you're not, if you're new to the game? You're not. You're going to depend on application writers and spend sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars. And this isn't to scare you, but this is to say this is all information that you can produce on your own, that you can gather on your own to start your own process. You don't always need people like me to get it done. And that's especially true for folks who qualify for that first tranche of 100 to 200 licenses of you know, business experience and, and the impacted status. Um, those are the regs that we've seen so far in terms of the draft regulations. We don't know yet what the regulations are gonna look like for the rest of the applicants. So it potentially could be a little bit more complicated, but we've had many assurances from the share and others that it will be a simple process that folks can engage with and that um, it's, it, it'll be accessible and equitable. The All most right. radical thing you can do is get rid of people like me in this process. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. I mean, sometimes things that are equitable are statements against interest. I'm not afraid to make it. Right? Like, there are always going to be people who are like, I want the hand holding. I want you to do this for me. I want to talk to you every six minutes. And maybe not everybody is in this room, but again, the, New York has actually done, particularly with this first tranche, a wonderful job of saying, you don't need that right now. You don't need that right now. And I have a feeling that other tranches are going to look very similar, particularly for those category of licenses that are designated, as Annette says, for social equity, which are the delivery license and the nursery license in particular. Um, and so, yeah, I, this is all to say, you don't always need people like me and um, you can definitely get the work done until you need to sign until there's money or a signature needed. You can do this initial lift on your own. Absolutely. So we are almost out of time. We only have time for one more question. I, I do want to shout out the community boards who have been such great partners for us, who helped us tonight. <laughs> community board 9, 10, 11, and 12. Uh, we have full Uptown Unity here. And uh, a special thank you to Monique Harding Cordero, who has been leading the Cannabis Task Force on CB. Uh, 10, sorry, CB9. Uh, Domingo uh, from CB12 was here earlier, but we're, we're grateful for all of your leadership. And final question, uh, are there any planned socially equitable uh, opportunities for entering into the cultivation and processing aspects of the cannabis industry? These segments um, of the business are not particularly inclusive presently. Um, and it's, it's about access to workforce and education, et cetera. So again, there's a target of 50% of licenses um, being granted across all license type to social equity applicants. Um, 
the challenges there, of course, are going to be access to land, access to capital. Um, but there is, you know, what the future of um, equity from OCM and CCB and any kind of packages that they might put together along the lines of this loan fund or something else are yet to be seen. But the opportunities will be there for um, social equity applicants in, in those two licenses. And, and on. one clarification, uh, it's not just cultivation and processing that are not very equitable. No yeah. aspect of cannabis around the country is very equitable. If you look at the number of women that are involved, if you look at the number of um, folks, uh, uh, black and brown, people of color, it's uh, an embarrassment around the country, and we're trying to make that uh, change here in New York. Yeah, and the last thing about that conditional cultivation mentorship mentorship program that Tremaine failed to mention is if you get into the program, it's actually a backdoor to a conditional cultivation mm -hmm. license. Yeah. So it's an, a tremendous opportunity. Uh, the Hood Incubator and Uptown Cannabis Coalition are a pipeline to those names to the NYC GPA. So you can tap into our sites to Latinas Grow, to Hood Incubator, to UCC, to get to Anaclusive, to get your name into that pipeline if you're interested in that. Inclusive. Very quick, yes. People really have to pay attention right now to the medical industry. As we're all hammering for what will be hundreds or thousands of licenses, I want everyone to close their eyes and think about 10 conglomerate certificate holders licensees in the medical side, and that these licenses we're talking about, in theory, they're talking about might be worth uh, 1 million to 5 million. A medical vertical license is valued at $250 million, and those licensee holders are all white companies. And so when we're talking about equity in my community, I'm saying to the state of New York and to the governor right now, I want equity in the medical space just as much as I want it in the adult use space because we don't have one black or brown licensee holder in the entire medical industry in New York and that's unacceptable and that's also something we have to work on changing. Well, you know one, applaud please. You know one place where women and women of color are well represented? This panel, Come on. you guys have been awesome. Give them a huge round of applause. Thank you, Carlene. Thank you, Carlene, Annette, Christina, Catherine, Sandra, and Saul, too. We love you. And she had to leave, but thank you to Chair Tremaine Wright. Give them a huge round of applause. Stay around, guys, too. We'll be here. Get food and enjoy. Thank you so much. Muchísimas gracias.